In your mind, is social media, me, media an isolating technology, or is it a connecting technology? To explore this, let's consider our passions. What is your passion? What reaches into your soul and calls to you? Who shares this passion with you, and how are you connected? This group of like-minded people, where do they gather? How often do they meet? Where do they find new members? And if you had an army of people who shared that passion with you, what would you do with the army? Reflect on the world. Think for a moment of this past week. Think about the events in your family, your life, your community, the globe. No lack of problems, no lack of opportunities, no lack of challenges. What if you could face those challenges with a group of people who shared your common interest, who had common values, but came from different backgrounds? Backgrounds that allowed to, to bring a different approach to that challenge. They would be diverse, but they would be focused. 25 years ago, such a community might meet in a single geographic location once a year or maybe every several years. With virtual communities, they could meet anytime. What is a virtual community, Howard? Well, when I came up with the term, it was 1987, and the emphasis was really on community rather than the virtual part because people were asking me whether anyone besides a, some, some kind of maybe anti-social electrical engineer would be interested in using computers to communicate with people. And I was very excited because what I had discovered in bulletin board systems and, and ultimately the well were real people who became part of my life. In fact, babysat for my daughter. I was at their weddings. I went to their funerals. I sat by their deathbeds. Anything that you do in a real community was happening with this group of people and I wanted to get the word out that even though we met through computers, we're real people and our relationships are real. That was a very important part of the well, this notion, this idea that uh, it, was a, it was a localized environment, a localized community. How important was that face-to-face -face contact for the development of this community? I think fortunately for the development of that community, it was originally quite local because you had to make a local phone call through an ancient technology known as a modem, there was not an internet then. So people in the San Francisco Bay Area within, let's say, an hour's drive of the office where the computer was, eventually began getting together. And that was, I think, very important in the development of the sense of community among those people, but also online. And eventually, of course, it included many people from many parts of the world who weren't in the San Francisco Bay Area, but that sense of, of knowing people and having some kind of significant relationship that could translate to the physical world. I, I don't like to say real world because it's, it's real online for a lot of people. That that really translated over the years to people who weren't part of that original group or in the San Francisco Bay Area. There are critics of online communities, of, of even you know, relationships via Facebook and, and all these, these types of contemporary online relationships. And can you describe why an online community can be conceived of as a community? Well, first of all, I think it's always important to think critically about our technologies and our enthusiasms. And there are some serious questions to ask about online relationships. But there have been many instances in which there are, are people for different reasons. They're, they're sick or they're, they're in a scary part of town where they don't want to leave their apartment at night. Or maybe they're older and they don't get around that much. Or like myself and many others, I work at home. Where am I going to get my relationships? Am I, I go, go to a bar or a, a coffee house or, or, or do I log on online? So not everybody has that kind of old village, small town, everybody knows your name, physical community. Yeah. 
Why don't I talk about the online community and how it really challenges our thought process of what we understand a community to be. See, online sort of dispenses with geographic boundaries. So, I mean, there are no time zones. Even things like age, gender and ethnicity don't, don't exist anymore. Not when you're online. And that's really the new paradigm. For the people that are old enough, like me, <laughs> then uh, what our traditional understanding of community is, really is the new paradigm of being anonymous, being faceless, being able to work in a media that no longer adequately expresses these sort of hand gestures, you know. And that's what we've got to deal with. For the people that have been brought up online, it's quite a different experience entirely. What they have to come to grips with is becoming an active member of a community, creating an identity for themselves, actually having a point of presence. And that's quite a challenge in itself. Because the offline environment that we know and love is pretty simple. I mean, you, you know, you're talking face to face, as we are now, being offline. But the online is completely faceless. So I want to talk about three things tonight. How social media is disconnecting us, what's happening now, and how we can do better. Gallup took a poll in 2001, and every average American said that they had 10 really close friends. The same poll this year said we had two. So what happened? Where did everybody go? And I think we know where. I think we've all seen this by now, maybe even been a little guilty of it ourselves. I see families like this out to dinner all the time and it drives me nuts. And I see couples on dates, clearly together, but on their cell phones. It's one of the strangest things I've ever seen. But to me, what does this say when we are together? To me, it says that there's someone, anyone, on the other end of the screen that's way more important than you who's right in front of my face. There's a study by Mary Meeker that says we touch our phones or check our phones 150 times a day, and we upload 1.8 billion pictures to Facebook. That's a little over a sixth of the population a day for pictures. So this is the third common objection I hear when I suggest to people that they quit social media. And in some sense, I think it might be one of the most important. So this objection goes as follows. Cal, maybe I agree with you. Maybe you're right. It's not a fundamental technology. Maybe using social media is not at the core of my professional success. But you know what? It's harmless. I have some fun on it. Weird Twitter is funny. I don't even really use it that much. I'm a first adopter. It's just kind of interesting to try it out. And, and maybe I might miss out on something if I don't use it. What's the harm? So again, I look back and I say, this objection also is nonsense. In this case, what it misses is what I think is a very important reality that we need to talk about more frankly, which is that social media brings with it multiple well-documented significant harms. And we actually have to confront these harms head on when trying to make decisions about whether or not we embrace this technology and let it into our lives. So one of these harms that we know this technology brings has to do with your professional success. So I just argued before that the ability to focus intensely to produce things that are rare and valuable, to hone skills that the marketplace values, that this is what's going to matter in our economy. But right before that, I argued that social media tools are designed to be addictive. The actual design desired use case of these tools is that you fragment your attention as much as possible throughout your waking hours. That's how these tools are designed to use. Well, we have a growing amount of research which tells us that if you spend large portions of your day in a state of fragmented attention, so large portions of your day where you're constantly breaking up your attention, take a quick glance, do a just check, let me just quickly look at Instagram, that this can permanently reduce your capacity for concentration. In other words, you could permanently reduce your capacity to do exactly the type of deep effort that we're finding to be more and more necessary in an increasingly competitive economy. So social media use is not harmless. It can actually have a significant negative impact on your ability to thrive in the economy. I am especially worried about this when we look at the younger generation coming up, which is the most saturated in this technology. If you lose your ability 
to sustain concentration, you're going to become less and less relevant to this economy. There are now people in their mid to getting on to advanced teens um, who have never known, obviously, uh, a world without the web. In fact, there may be 20 people, 20 years, 20 year olds who have never known anything but that. Have they developed strange thumbs? Do they have peculiar ways of talking and listening? Do their eyes glaze over when they have to concentrate for more than 30 seconds? No, I don't believe any of that. I'm not particularly negative or pessimistic about the social qualities, the linguistic qualities, the concentration qualities of Generation Web, as they're called. Um, I honestly believe that if you were to go back into the 1920s and take an ordinary semi-educated 15-year-old and place him next to an ordinary semi-educated 15-year-old now, you would find the one now knows more, understands more, is more socially confident, is more aware of the rest of the world, is more able and more adept at research, uh, may not be able to say the nine times table as fluently or repeat a moa massa matta mama sa matta sa may not be able to do that. Is that such a great loss to an old fashion person like me? I'd love to think people could do both. But let's, let's get real about this. Connection is what humans crave. It's what we are all about. It's something that separates us from animals. It's even pre, it's, it even comes before the fact that we, we have language because the language is an example of a, of a, if you like, a neural technology we have, we have created to answer this need for connection.